I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It has been quite educational so far. Hopefully, this talk will be interesting to some of you. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Anish Malik. Uh, who is currently in Chile. Uh, is, uh, okay. So, the question, so the entire uh, talk is about two random matrices. So, random toplets and random Hankel matrices. So, let me define them. So, this is the random toplets matrix uh, and also symmetric. So, the random toplets matrix looks like this. You have x1, x2, xn minus 1 and it is also symmetric. So, the same and it is a toplet, so it is the same x0 on the diagonal, x1 here, etc. So, it is constant on these diagonals. Okay. And the random Hankel matrix is the matrix which is constant on these anti-diagonals. So, you have let us say x1 here, x2 and x2, x3, x3, x3 and so on up to xn, xn plus 1 up to x 2 n minus 1 and it is constant on these diagonals. Well, x i's are i i d normal 0 1 random variables. So, that will be the assumption. So, the entire uh, talk is about these two random matrices. So, these were first uh, introduced by Bai, Zidong Bai in uh, 1999. He introduced these as uh, more uh, restricted matrices compared to Wigner and other things and asked various questions about it, uh, in particular about the limiting spectral distribution and stuff like that. So, some of it was uh, proved. So, in uh, 2003, I think, uh, 2000, sorry, 2005 and 6. So, let us uh, also let me write LTN for the empirical spectral distribution of TN. And similarly, uh, and I will write LTN uh, bar for the expected uh, empirical measure. So, this is the measure which puts mass 1 over n at the eigenvalues of Tn and this is the expected measure. So, these are, so in a paper of uh, Brick, Dembo and Jiang, this is from 2006. There is also a paper of Hammond and Miller in 2005. They showed that the limiting spectral distributions exist. So, these things have a limit. So, they showed that LTN and LTN bar, they converge to some measure mu sub t. And the same is true for Hankel matrices. So, the Hammond and Miller did it for the toplets and Brick Dembo Jiang did it for both. So, what are these mu t and mu h? So, these are not random of course. So, they are deterministic measures and uh, they, this does not require the normality assumption. So, under so you only need to assume that the x i's have, have mean 0 and variance 1 but they showed that these uh, limits do not matter. Uh, they, I mean, it is the same for all such distributions and uh, uh, yeah, and they are not random. Okay. So, that is the result. So, the, their approach was by the method of moments. So, the proof was just, uh, I mean, of course, uh, the method of moments, the combinatorics is much more complicated here because the same excise are there in many places and uh, you have to keep track of uh, many things. So, but it can be carried through and they found uh, some descriptions for the moments. Uh, so, they showed that the moments of these quantities converge and they determine a unique measure which they call mu sub t and mu sub h. But the moments are highly inexplicit, uh, they are comp complicated. So, it is enough to get some properties, moments are good to get certain properties of a measure. For instance, from this one, it is firstly, it uniquely determines a measure that is one. Second, you can say something about the tails of the distribution. In particular, both of these are unbounded uh, support. So, mu sub t and mu sub h have unbounded support. That, all that can be got from the moments. 
But uh, if you draw a picture, if you, it's a very simple to do a simulation. So the picture of mu sub t, if you draw, if you draw a uh, random toplitz matrix, take its eigenvalues, draw the histogram. This is what mu sub t looks like, and mu sub h looks like this. They are both symmetric about the origin. Uh, this is this looks unimodal. That looks bimodal. So some things that moments don't tell us. So these are the questions. So moments are good for certain things, but certain properties are hard to say from the moments. So for example, the questions are: Are they? Do they have densities? And uh, if they do have densities, can we say whether the densities are smooth and uh, smoothness? And properties that you see in the picture, such as unimodality or bimodality. So these are questions which are uh, not apparent. So in the very basic case of Wigner random matrix, of course, uh, it was done by the method of moments, but the moments are just Catalan numbers. And even if uh, Wigner did not know it before, it is not hard to compute the generating function and see that the measure is the uh, uh, semicircle law. But here, uh, every moment is complicated. To calculate, say, the kth moment, uh, odd moments are zero, an even moment. Uh, to calculate the kth moment, you have to, there are uh, something like 2 to the k uh, integrals, and the integrals can have a dimension going from 0 to k or so on the unit cube. So they are highly inexplicit. Even numerically, I was never able to compute more than uh, up to the 10th moment of these things. Maybe if somebody is uh, more savvy, they can compute. And uh, the point is, if you can just guess the measure, of course, from the moments, then uh, well and good. But nobody has uh, ventured a guess on what exactly this mu, mu sub t and mu sub h are. So our, what I'm going to say may have uh, some suggestion for that. So this question, uh, there is not much work. And the only thing I know about this is that this answer, uh, this was answered as yes for mu sub t. This is a paper of uh, Arnab Sen and Balint Vivar in 2011. So they showed that mu sub t is absolutely continuous and has a bounded density. So what we have proved is the same for also the Hankel case. And our proof works for both the toplets and Hankel. Okay. And uh, of course, mu sub t is a repetition. This is a proof of a theorem of Sane and Vigar. But our bounds are better. Okay. So we have bounds something like the bounds are like, uh, it's not important and I'll not talk about that here, but bounds are uh, actually reasonable looking numbers like 1 by square root of pi and 1 by square root of e. So they are off by, if you compare with the numerical simulation, uh, this 1 by square root pi is off by a factor of something like 1.4, a little more than that, 1.45. This is off by a factor of something like 1.85 or so. So it's uh, close to, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, so that is, the, that is the theorem of which I want to explain the proof. And uh, well, I'll not talk about other random matrices, but our methods work for uh, some more general class of uh, matrices. So for instance, one can, uh, so, uh, which again, I will not talk about this. So what is uh, generalization here? So if you have a countable group, you can form a toplitz matrix. So let's say we have x, g, g in the id normal 0, 1. So you can form a toplitz matrix, which is just
uh, x g inverse h uh, indexed by the elements of the group or a Hankel matrix which is the g comma h entry depends only on g times h. So, these are uh, toplets and Hankel matrices associated to a group. What you can do is you can take finite subsets of the group going to the full group and take the corresponding matrices and ask about their uh, limiting distribution. So, our methods work uh, for the case uh, when if you take G to be ZD and you take going boxes, then we can show uh, all the things go through and we can show absolute continuity and stuff like that. Okay. So, in the more general case, I am quite confused about this question whether there is a good answer or not, I, I, I do not know. Okay. Uh, please ask me if there are any questions at any time. Uh, what I want to do is uh, to give an idea of the uh, proof of uh, this uh, theorem. Maybe I leave this. So, uh, the proof has really two steps. Huh. No, no, they are both unbounded. So, support is unbounded, yes. Both of them. Uh, because the moments go faster than exponentially, one can uh, see that they cannot be bounded. So, there are many interesting questions about these things like the largest eigenvalue and various questions about this which I uh, will not be talking about. I have nothing to say. So, there are really two parts in the proof. Uh, step one actually it is quite interesting and if some uh, I have it is a uh, Okay, I will at this level let me just say it like this. So, so we can the main idea is that we can write this toplets matrix as a sum of two random matrices. So, we write uh, T n as a sum of two random matrices where A n and B n are independent. So, this is independent random matrices. And if you look at the LSD of this. Uh, both of them converge to normal distribution. So, you have two independent random matrices, their limiting spectral distributions are actually normal. And uh, uh, so, and similarly in the case of Hankel, we write it as A n plus B n, ok, not the same A n plus B n. Again, they are independent. And their limiting distributions uh, converge to this symmetric Rayleigh distribution. So this, uh, so it's it's just the symmetrized version of the Rayleigh distribution. Mod x e power minus x square by two is the density. Now anybody with experience in random matrix should uh, think at this point the problem is done. You have two independent random matrices and they have very nice uh, dis limiting distributions and you are adding them. So, how can it not be absolutely continuous? So, uh, indeed it sort of explains the picture too. You have you are there is some kind of convolution. So, the distrib limiting distribution of this mu sub t has to be some kind of a convolution of normal with itself and mu sub h has to be some kind of convolution of this Rayleigh distribution with itself which sort of seems to explain uh, why this picture should look like this. It is clearly this, this density looks like this. So, you convolve, uh, if you take a normal convolution of this, you will see a picture a bit like this. But the point is the, the operation here is neither the ordinary convolution nor free convolution, it is a different convolution which uh, we sort of understand at the level of moments, but I we do not really understand well. Uh, maybe if one understands it, maybe one can even tell exactly what is this mu sub t and mu sub h. 
Okay, so a step is needed. So from here, it's not immediate. Uh, so at first, I thought maybe it is free convolution, but it is not. At some tenth moment, they differ actually. So one, uh, the tenth moment, one of them is 42, the other is 44 or something. Okay, it's not free. That much is clear. So there is a second step, which is a spectral averaging. Uh, I'll explain it later. So spectral averaging is a technique that uh, is uh, well known to many people in op random operators and so on. So here, uh, there is a spectral averaging. Uh, uh, there is a different spectral averaging we have to do in the Toplitz case and in the Hankel case. So these are the two main steps. And from that, we can get the absolute continuity of mu sub t and mu sub h. Okay. So what I would like to do in the remaining time is explain these two steps. Now, uh, so I will explain the first step. So the first step in the Toplitz case. So this is something curious to me. I think this must be, there is an observation about Toplitz matrices, nothing random, which probably is known, but I could not find uh, anywhere. And uh, so first, don't, uh, let's think of uh, just a general Toplitz matrix with not even uh, Hermitian. It can be a general Toplitz matrix. And uh, so this is not random, not symmetric. Okay, so there, there is a representation that we found for uh, general Toplitz like this. So to explain that, let me say uh, the main uh, character in all this is this matrix L which is 0, 1, once on the super diagonal, and 0 elsewhere. So clearly, everything, uh, the Toplitz matrix can be written in terms of this as x0 times identity plus uh, xk times L raised to the power k. L raised to the power k will have once on the kth diagonal here. and x minus k, so if you want it on the other side, you just transpose it, L star raised to the power k. So this is the, uh, this x, uh, any Toplitz matrix can be written like this. Now, uh, a lot of things in Toplitz matrices, I mean, for instance, also the, uh, the Sain and Vigak paper, the general idea is it looks almost like a circulant matrix. Okay, which would be much better, but it is not circulant. It's a, in fact a slightly problematic uh, matrix. It's not normal. So the courageous step here is to actually uh, write this zero as one plus minus one. So we'll write it as zero one one one, and put a one at the uh, n comma one entry, and everything else is zero plus. You consider a similar matrix, but put a minus one here. Okay, so this matrix I call C, and this matrix is D. Okay, it's actually two times L. Sorry, two L is two times this, and that is C plus D. Okay, so the uh, I just put a one here and a minus one here. So this is very uh, this representation. Wh what is the point of it? So here are some basic points. C and D are unitary. They are unitary matrices. Uh, it's quite clear. C is a circulant matrix. So this one, I'll just call it twisted circulant. So what is C doing? If you think of a discrete cycle, C is just a shift operator on the discrete cycle. And D is also a shift, except that at one location, it flips the sign. OK, so C and D are both unitary. Uh, in fact, c to the power n is identity, and d to the power n is minus identity. If you apply d n times, you just get minus identity. 
okay and uh, most importantly not only is l l is half uh, half c plus half d but also if i take l to any power p it is just half of c to the power p plus half of d to the power p for okay because if you take l square l square is the one with ones here on the next diagonal and c square has ones on the next diagonal as well as two ones here and d square will have two minus ones here etc so this works so for all p less than equal to n minus 1 and if you take the transpose you just get that c star is same as c inverse this is unitary c to the minus p plus half of d raised to the power minus p this is true for all p up to n minus 1. So the point is this L is written in terms of these two unitaries. So the entire toplitz matrix can be written also in terms of C and D. Okay, so what, uh, what does that lead to about the matrix itself? So this implies from this we get that T is, uh, well it is some polynomial of uh, C and a polynomial of D because you write each L power K as and L power minus K in terms of C and D. So what we get is, uh, let me write it as A plus B where A is summation AJ uh, C to the power J. Okay, so here I'll make an assumption. Let me take N to be odd. Okay, this is just uh, convenient. Uh, there is a different, slightly different representation when N is even. But let me take n to be odd, then you can write, and this is of the form b j d raised to the power j, j equals minus m plus 1 to m minus 1. So where you can write down exactly where what a j and b j are, a j is something like x j plus Okay. So you have this matrix, so these two matrices, you see A is just a polynomial of C. So we know it's full spectral decomposition. So C, it has the same eigenvectors as C, only the eigenvalues change. So the eigenvalues of C are in fact, uh, okay, we can, I, I did not write it here, maybe I should say, what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of uh, C? So let's write V theta for the vector 1 e to the i theta e to the i n minus 1 theta. Then c eigenvectors are just c v theta is e to the i theta v theta for any uh, nth root of unity. And for d, the eigenvalues are, uh, it's similar, i t v tau, where e to the i n tau is minus 1. So the eigenvalues of c are roots of uh, nth roots of 1, eigenvalues of d are nth roots of minus 1. And eigenvectors are just uh, these things. So it's just very explicit. So thus, of course, uh, A will have exactly the same eigenvectors as this, except the eigenvalues change. And D will, uh, B will have the same eigenvalues as, uh, eigenvectors as uh, D, eigenvectors, eigen, uh, sorry, eigenvectors as D, eigenvalues change. That's all there is. So, uh, in particular, so this representation, so uh, it may be of some use in general, I don't know, but if you, for example, a basic theorem, this is just a small digression. If you think of the Zigo limit theorem, which is a theorem about determinants of toplitz matrices, the Zigo limit theorem is completely obvious for separately for this A and for uh, B. Because if you, you know exactly what the eigenvalue, so if you start with a toplitz matrix with a certain symbol, and you write down this A, the eigenvalues of A will be the values of the symbol at the roots of unity, and the eigenvalues of B are the values of the symbol at roots of minus 1, and uh, so the determinants are just these products which if you exponentiate right as e to the log, you get the Zigo limit theorem. I don't know if for instance one can prove the Zigo limit theorem for T from this, this I don't know. But maybe there is, so it's an elementary uh, looking observation, so it must be somewhere, but uh, if somebody knows, I would like to know it afterwards, okay? So in particular, what happens when you apply it to the random matrix? Uh, so 
So in, in the random case, xj and x minus j are the same and that is some normal distributed, normally distributed random variable. Therefore, uh, aj and bj are independent. So, you can work out everything. So, th this is the claim. So, you have broken that matrix T into sum of two independent random matrices. Uh, and okay, what are the eigenvalues of A? They are of the form, uh, well, they will look like So, you take any uh, nth root of 1 and then you form this polynomial. So, that is an eigenvalue. So, you get this, you have this eigenvalues of A, which are very explicit and they are all linear combination of the same ages. So, they are all normal actually. The eigenvalues of this uh, big matrix A and B are actually normal and they are almost independent in fact. So, I will just write that uh, A is uh, so, uh, I will just write the conclusion because I want to tell a little bit about the second step. So, let me write what is the conclusion. So, this A and B we can uh, exactly solve uh, using this. So, what happens is, so we, A looks like this, lambda 0 times P0 plus lambda 1 P1 plus lambda M minus 1 P M minus 1, where this, these are projections, these are rank 2. Uh, when you work out, you see that one eigenvalue occurs with multiplicity 1, others occur with multiplicity 2 because of the n equal n odd uh, case. If it's, if n is E1, then there are two eigenvalues of multiplicity 1, etc. Not so important. But these are rank 2 projections and this is rank 1. And they are, uh, PJs are not random at all. They are completely coming from the eigenvectors of uh, C. Okay. And lambda j are almost IID normal 0 half random variables. So, this is, uh, I write almost, one can work out the correlation of these things, it is very small. So, for the talk, I will just pretend that they are actually IID. Okay. And the representation for B is quite similar. There are some and mu j are almost iid normal 0 half and q these are rank 1 and these are rank 2. So, p j and q j are not random that is the point. So, this is the representation this is step 1 where you have written the tuplets matrix as a sum of two matrices which are completely uh, understandable. So, from this it is obvious that the limiting spectral distribution of A and B are actually uh, just normal 0 1, uh, sorry normal 0 half. So, the Hankel case is uh, similar except that uh, uh, maybe I do not uh, write it now uh, in the interest of time. In the Hankel case we can do the same. Uh, yeah, what is the difference? So, Maybe I finish the Toplitz case and in the end I will mention the Hankel case. So, this is what works in the Toplitz matrix. So, from this how do we see the absolute continuity of the uh, of T for example. Okay. So, we have written T as A plus B and uh, we want to, uh, okay. So, the main 
uh, way in which we will show that uh, the absolute continuity of this is uh, to show that this TLJS transform of the expected uh, empirical measure is bounded uniformly. Uh, there is an N. So we will consider Gn of Z, which is the expectation trace Zi minus Tn inverse 1 over N. And we show that Z in the upper half plane, that is imaginary Z positive, uh, So there is a uniform bound for the TLJS transforms of the expected empirical distributions of all TNs. So from that, it is immediate that the limiting spectral distribution will have exactly the same bound. And uh, it is a well-known fact that if you get a bound on the uh, TLJS transform, that means the density has exactly the same bound. Because when you approach the uh, real line uh, from the upper half plane, the imaginary part of the TLJS transform converges to the density at the point. So you get exactly the same bound maybe with a 1 over pi factor uh, for the density. So that's, the, that's what we have to show. So how, how uh, we do that is, uh, so we have this, so, so let me write what this spectral averaging is. So let me write the spectral averaging lemma. So this is the general nature of spectral averaging lemma. Uh, incidentally, in the work of uh, Arnab Sen and Balint Virag, where they proved this, they also use spectral averaging, but it's a much more complicated one. Ours is a very simple uh, one-dimensional spectral averaging. So let's consider M. So we have a uh, so this is a real symmetric matrix. And then we add, so this is a projection. And lambda is a parameter. So we think of lambda as random distributed according to some density. So this is a probability density function on the real line. Okay, so think of it as a random operator where you have a fixed one plus lambda times a projection. This will be relevant here where we, since we know how to, uh, the spectral decomposition of ANs, what we are going to do is just fix one of those lambda case, a condition on all the rest, then we have a matrix in this form. So if we condition on everything except say lambda 1, we have lambda 1 P1 plus the entire rest of A and B together will be M0. So that will be the idea. Okay, so then the fact is that if you uh, take trace of uh, p times zi minus m lambda inverse p uh, expectation, uh, well, expectation is, is with respect to phi. If we, cons if we average this over the density phi, then we just get phi times um, okay, let me put a absolute value, pi times uh, the supnorm of phi times the dimension of uh, the projection. So this is the spectral averaging lemma. No, uh, there are, I mean, so of course, if phi is not a bounded density, I don't get anything, but assumptions on which No, M is much higher dimensional, it's okay, no problem. Yeah, but here we are not actually studying the full steel just transform. It's only on the projection in this P direction. That is uh, important, yeah. So for instance, how, how does that help here? So when we come to the uh, random situation, so how is this useful? So let me indicate how this is useful. If you apply that with uh, some, say, we fix the kth one and so on, so we get that the expectation of trace pk zi minus t 
inverse p sub k. From this, we get that it is bounded by uh, pi times uh, here. Okay, so phi is so phi is the normal zero. So here I am fixing say lambda one, uh, so some kth one. Then we have the normal uh, density. So let me just write it as some constant times two, because rank of the projection there is two or one, depending on which one you take. So you just get uh, a constant for each k up to huh. yeah so the i got almost id what it is is that when you condition on the rest of them the variance of this is still very close to half okay uh, it is always more than one fourth but if uh, with n going large uh, it is in fact you can make it as close to half as possible so what we do is we condition on the rest, then we still have a normal random variable with that much variance, and that is what is used in the spectral averaging. And then you take a further expectation over all the variables to get this. And then when you sum it over k, you get uh, the sum of all these with all the projections will give you the uh, Stier-Jest transform. So you just get that the Stier-Jest transform, which is the average of these things, will give you uh, that's the, that's all. So the, this is the key point uh, in the uh, proof. No, the, those PKs, they sum to identity, right? This is the spectral, yeah. They, that's the spectral uh, decomposition of A. So the sum of those projections is identity. When you add them, you just get the uh, trace of Zi minus T inverse. So there's no huh. there's no, no, but we have to average. G of Z has a one over N also. So it is the number of uh, uh, summons is also N, uh, and it's exactly canceling. That. Any other questions? Uh, so. This is how it works. Uh, now, uh, yeah, okay. How many minutes do I have? Uh, two, three? Uh, two, three, four minutes. Ah, so okay. Like okay, so, uh, yeah, so I'm thinking whether to indicate a proof of this or to just uh, tell what happens in the Hankel case. Maybe I just mention what happens in the Hankel case. Uh, so in the Hankel, Hankel case is actually similar but a bit more complicated. Uh, so in the Hankel case, the first step is actually quite similar. Maybe I just say it in words. So here what happened was we, you take any toplitz matrix, we could write it as a sum of two matrices. One is a polynomial of C and one is a polynomial of D. Uh, in the Hankel case, we can, you take any Hankel case without randomness, we can write it as a sum of two matrices, A and B. Now, uh, the point is, A is, uh, uh, everything is slightly more complicated. Uh, so, in the toplitz case, A can be reduced to diagonal form, but, I mean, the eigenvectors don't depend on uh, the entries of T. That was the point. But here, it depends, but you can bring it to block diagonal form where these are two cross two blocks. So the, this, mat this matrix A can be brought to two cross two blocks by a unitary transformation conjugation which does not depend on the entries of the matrix. Uh, in the toplitz case, the same could be done up to diagonal, but here it is only up to two cross two block uh, form. And a similar uh, thing for B, uh, we can bring it to two cross two block form, etc. So the spectral averaging uh, also got a bit more complicated uh, because, uh, well, there is a spectral averaging lemma where uh, this quantity that we uh, do spectral averaging over this uh, is not a positive definite matrix. So at least when I asked a few spectral averaging experts, they said it only works when uh, positive you have a positive definite uh, perturbation. But uh, in our case, it's a very small rank perturbation. It's only two, 
Therefore, we can uh, we could handle it directly, and uh, we have an analogous spectral averaging lemma from which we can get the conclusion. So, the key point is the proof of this, but okay, I don't have time for that, so I'll stop here.